So we'll now start with reading number 19 of the level 3 curriculum that will teach us about the process of asset allocation. So let's understand what we have studied up till now and what should logically be the next step. So we studied the behavioral biases that people have. We then went on to understand the requirements adjusted for those biases when we studied the IPS and the individual investor portfolios. We did the same analysis for institutional investors. That is, we understood the risk tolerance and the requirements for our client. We then understood the capital market expectations. That is, what is the market expected to deliver and what are the various asset classes expected to deliver. The next step is to combine the requirements along with the capital market expectations to decide an asset allocation for the investor or the client. The asset allocation broadly speaking is fixing on how much debt you want to keep in the portfolio, how much equity you want to keep, how much venture capital you want to keep, what percentage of the different broad asset classes do you want to keep in the portfolio. We are not talking about picking specific stocks or picking specific bonds. We are giving a broader allocation of how much debt and how much equity should we keep. So it combines capital market expectations and the investor's risk, return and investment constraint. This is called the strategic asset allocation or the target weights or the target allocation for the investor. Short term deviations may happen from the long term allocation that we will derive. However, these will be a result of active management and normally should give us excess return. The strategic asset allocation reflects the investor's desired systematic risk exposure. reflects the investor's desired systematic risk exposure that is from his risk tolerance and return requirements how much should be allocated to bonds how much to equities and how much to other asset classes tactical asset allocation is the result of active management wherein the objective is to take advantage of any perceived short-term opportunities or mispricings in the market so if we feel that equities are undervalued or bonds are undervalued, then we may tilt from our long term targets by a small amount, not by a major amount, in order to capture and profit from these opportunities. Tactical asset allocation introduces additional risk in the portfolio and hence must be justified by additional return. Now why asset allocation is so important? and it is actually one of the most important decisions that you will take for your client much more than picking individual stocks timing or doing anything else or trading in the portfolio <laughs> not only does it reflect the long-term goals and long-term expectations as we studied it provides discipline empirically speaking we find that 94 percent of the variability of total portfolio returns is explained by the strategic asset allocation. So in the long run, if one portfolio gives $100 as final value, another gives 90, a third gives 120, the majority part of why this difference comes can be explained because portfolio one probably had 50-50 debt equity, portfolio two had 60-40, Portfolio 3 had 30, 70 or some combination. So 94% of the long term variation in returns amongst portfolios can be attributed directly to strategic asset allocation. Which equity you picked or which <coughs> debt you picked makes a much smaller impact over the long run. In most portfolios or in most diverse por diversified portfolios, it is a decision of how much equity to keep and how much debt to keep. After that, one diversified portfolio doesn't give very different return from another diversified portfolio is what we've seen in the long run. 
returns to market timing that is trying to buy cheap and sell expensive and security selection that is investing your energy in picking stocks that you think are undervalued so that they will outperform other stocks are minimal at best and at worst they are insufficient to cover the associated operating expenses fund management fees and the trading costs and the brokerages that you have to pay in rebalancing and trading so definitely it is one of the most important decisions and the most important processes that need to be done in the construction of a portfolio hence we need to understand the process thoroughly and the different theories behind constructing an asset allocation in an asset liability management we construct our portfolio or we decide our asset allocation such that it closely mimics the liability or it closely meets the liabilities and then we try to maximize whatever is the surplus so if our liabilities for example are fixed income like then a huge chunk of our asset allocation or our assets will also be fixed income line fixed income type at least to the extent that i have met my liabilities after i have met my liabilities if there is any additional assets left then those assets form the surplus the surplus can be invested in risky assets and in more riskier securities because we have anyways created an asset portfolio that mimics the liabilities or that changes in line with the liabilities the surplus is then maximized to generate a high return this approach invariably tends to have a relatively higher allocation to fixed income securities because if our liability is fixed we need 10 million dollars for our purchase or for our house purchase or we need half a million dollars for our children edu children's education then those liabilities are fixed and the best way to meet those liabilities would, would be to invest in zero coupon bonds or fixed income securities or portfolios like that so it can be a little expensive as an approach because we need higher capital because we need high number of or high amount of fixed income securities so as to meet these liabilities specific liability modeling is needed so if our liabilities are not fixed or they are very variable then it will be tough to apply an alm type approach in the asset only approach we don't invest or we don't create an allocation to exactly mimic the liabilities so the idea is to generate the highest possible return within a given amount of risk the liabilities or the probability of meeting the liabilities gets automatically considered in the required rate of return so in both the individual investor and the institutional investor our required rate of return was mainly determined by analyzing our liabilities and how much we need for living for education etc so if we have the required rate of return it can be argued that we have our liabilities and then we need only generate a return higher than that required rate of return and automatically our liabilities are met advantages you can hope to achieve an even higher return disadvantages that there is a risk of not funding specific liabilities and that risk is not accurately controlled as would be the case in an asset liability management approach in dynamic asset allocation we take a multi period view of the investment horizon so let's say we were creating a portfolio for 10 years or we were creating it for 1 year dynamic allocation realizes that movement in the portfolio within these 10 years that is in the next 2 years if i have a big gain or i have a big loss then that may change my risk return profile and that may change the required allocation for future years so even though we initially did a 10 year holistic analysis and then we fixed on an asset allocation to various assets dynamic asset allocation says that this may need to be changed depending on what actually happens as the investment progresses so performance in one period affects the required rate of return and the acceptable level of risk for 
subsequent periods of course in this kind of an approach we will have to regularly and repeatedly do our analysis after every few periods or after every period and rebalancing costs additional costs will come in so it will be a difficult and a more costly approach to implement and is more used by investors who have uncertain and changing liabilities wherein the risk of this asset allocation changing or the requirement of the asset allocation to change is actually much higher so for somebody whose liabilities are anyways quite fluctuating would probably need to reallocate his asset allocation also and will probably choose a dynamic approach where the benefits outdo the costs of this approach for other investors whose liabilities don't fluctuate much can follow a static allocation wherein throughout the investment horizon we maintain our target allocation to debt equity venture capital that we've decided in the beginning and any deviations are corrected so as to bring it back in line with that original asset allocation that we decided on <coughs> once again we must not forget the many behavioral biases that we studied and that individuals suffer from so behavioral biases can also cause the asset allocation to vary from the optimal loss aversion we studied was the reluctance of the investor to accept a loss hence if he needs to sell something he will first sell the investments in which he has had a profit the bias of loss aversion can cause concentrations in the portfolio concentration to loss making assets extra risky assets that we are unwilling to sell because we have made a loss similarly mental accounting makes us split our portfolio into layers each layer is managed separately to meet a particular goal the correlation between layers gets ignored again resulting in suboptimal asset allocations and suboptimal portfolios regret aversion implies that individuals want to avoid the feeling of regret that is <coughs> i knew it still i didn't act or i knew it still i made a mistake feeling of regret is much higher from doing something than from not doing something if a stock is expected to go up and i don't buy that stock will there be regret yes there will be that regret will be much lesser than the regret i will suffer if i purchased a stock b and the stock b went down or i had a loss regret from missing an opportunity is not that high because there are many assets that have gone up that keep going up but if i buy something actively and that goes down the feeling of regret is much higher investors want to avoid this feeling of regret this may also result in deviations from optimal allocations they may not invest in equities by looking at in the short term there can be a loss they may not invest in venture capital they may not invest in other instruments which are needed but the general view is that don't invest in equities there is a downturn everybody knows now is not the time to invest in equities now that is not a correct line of thinking because asset allocation prescribes that 50% needs to be in equity and 50% needs to be in debt but everybody is saying that do not invest in equities it is such a bad economy now if i invest in equities and equities fall i will have a lot of regret because i knew and still i invested so the result may be that i do not invest in equities at all which will be an inappropriate allocation because in the short term there may be a downturn in the long term we have seen that equity market returns tend to be higher than bond markets <coughs> which is consistent with the risk return hypothesis up till now we identified our risk tolerance or risk objective as either average above average or below average for both individual investors as well as for institutional clients what we can do as a one step ahead is place investors in numerical categories with the help of questionnaires or by any other means so as to 
have a more quantitative perspective of this average above average or below average one example could be that we score all individuals through some analysis you can do it any way you like so you place individuals in a ranking from 1 to 10 this is the risk aversion score individuals with a score of 7 to 10 we will call them as highly risk averse individuals with a score of 1 to 3 would be called highly risk tolerant that is they have a low risk aversion individuals between 4 to 6 we'll call them as average risk or medium risk what this will do is that it will help us analyze return better in conjunction with the risk so we will now understand a concept called utility adjusted return that is the return can be very high but is the utility of the return high utility please remembered was defined as satisfaction the return may be high but the satisfaction may not be very high if for getting that high return I have had to take a very high risk also satisfaction will be high if return is high and risk is low so utility adjusted return essentially computes the satisfaction derived from the return the satisfaction derived will not independently be a function of just the return it will be a function of the return in conjunction with the risk the model that the curriculum adopts calculates the utility adjusted return as the expected return on the portfolio minus 0 0.005 times the risk aversion score multiplied by the standard deviation of the portfolio squared so standard deviation is the risk of the portfolio please note standard deviation is entered in percentage in this formula and not in decimals if you enter the standard deviation in decimals then you have to change this to 0.5 into a into sigma p square if you are using the formula in this format then sigma has to be entered in percentage as we will understand with an example u is the investors utility from investing in the portfolio r is the expected return from the portfolio a is the investors risk aversion score so if somebody has a high risk aversion score automatically this negative chunk will become high for him if somebody has a low risk aversion score the negative chunk will become low for him sigma square is simply the variance of the portfolio or the risk of the portfolio mr thompson is a risk averse investor with a risk aversion score of 8 and requires a before tax return of 7% following two portfolios are available for asset allocation which portfolio will he likely choose and what if if he had a risk aversion score of So for portfolio X, the utility adjusted return <coughs> is simply the expected return that is 9 minus 0 0.005 into the risk aversion score into the standard deviation squared. For portfolio Y, the utility adjusted return simply would be or similarly would be 12 minus 0 0.005 into 16 into 8 that is the risk aversion score into 16 square so utility of portfolio X comes out to be 4.6 percent whereas that of portfolio Y comes out to be 1.76 percent so with a risk aversion score of 8 investors would rather take portfolio or Mr. Thompson would rather take portfolio X than portfolio Y if he was not such a risk averse investor however if his risk aversion score was only 2 then instead of 8 we would substitute 2 in the calculation <coughs> such that the utility of portfolio X would come out to be 7.79 percent 
and the utility of portfolio Y would come out to be 9.44%. In this case, portfolio or stock Y appears to be a better investor to Mr. Thompson than stock X. So it's not the return, it's the utility of the return. And utility is calculated adjusted for the risk. How you determine this risk aversion score, there is no quantitative model prescribed by the curriculum. But by asking various questions and assigning various weights to each question, you can formulate a questionnaire. And in the questionnaire, you can have questions like, do you like going to the casino? It, they can be non-financial questions also. Do you like doing risky activities? Do you think venture capital is a good investment? Do you think that portfolios should be safe? Questions like these you can formulate and then give a mathematical weighting to each of the questions and see that if everybody answers positively to all questions, his weight comes out to be 1. If he answers negatively to all questions, his score will come out to be 10. So you can have sort of 10 questions or 20 questions, something like that. You can formulate on your own and try to de determine a risk aversion score. There is no mathematical model prescribed. If it comes on the exam, normally the score will be given to you. We've studied the Roy safety first measure at level one that was measured as the excess return to the risk. Excess as calculated over and above the minimum acceptable return. Please remember, the higher the safety first ratio or the higher this calculation, the lower the probability of not meeting the minimum required return or the minimum acceptable return. What this method suggests is that you can keep the investor's critical return objectives as minimum acceptable return. And then see the return and the standard deviation of each of the portfolios. For example, we can take the return and standard deviations of the portfolios X and Y that we studied earlier and then calculate which of the portfolios has the higher safety first ratio. The portfolio that has the highest, highest safety first ratio has the lowest probability of not meeting the minimum required return. So you can calculate a utility adjusted return to select asset classes. You can also follow a Roy's safety first type of criteria to select portfolios. Depends if return is a bigger concern, then a utility adjusted return may be better. If meeting liabilities is the more critical return, that is your liabilities are not flexible, they have to be met come what may, then a Roy's safety first type of measure would be a better way to pick the asset classes or to pick the portfolio. Now we've heard of many asset classes. Broadly speaking, we've heard of equity and debt. Then we studied preferred capital or preferred equity. We've heard venture capital. We've heard private equity. We've heard hedge funds. Treasury inflation protected securities may also be thought of as a separate asset classes, even though it's a bond like structure. The question is, when should we categorize a set of securities as a separate asset class and when should we club them with an existing asset class? So emerging market equities, should they be clubbed as a separate asset class or should they generally be a part of equities is the question that we are trying to answer. Now the curriculum says that the following points need to be kept in mind when you are specifying asset classes or you are distributing all investment instruments, rather all investable instruments into different asset classes. First, assets that are being clubbed in one asset class should be similar from a descriptive as well as a statistical perspective. So, equity has claim to residual profits. Owners of these securities have claim on the residual profits of a company. 
Hence, we are clubbing all equities together. But they, may, they must be similar from a statistical perspective also. That is, historically, the returns of equities should have been highly correlated amongst themselves. Hence, we can put them in one asset class. Different asset classes. So, if equity is one asset class, debt is another asset class, so on and so forth, we have different asset classes. The asset classes per se should not be highly correlated amongst themselves. Otherwise, there is no benefit of investing in another asset class because it's giving us no diversification benefit. We want to invest in different instruments and different asset classes because we don't want our returns to be highly correlated and we want to reduce the risk from the low correlation that they exhibit. So, first of all, the assets put in individual classes should be similar, that is, should have a high correlation amongst themselves. Different asset classes should have low correlation amongst each other. Any individual asset cannot be classified into more than one class. So the definition of our classes or our asset classes should be precise enough such that if I get any new instrument, I should easily be able to place it in one asset class or the other. So if a new instrument or a new stock comes, then I should be able to place it in venture capital or equity or debt. If I'm confused whether should this be put in preferred equity or should this be put in equity or should this be put in debt, that means I have not defined my asset classes well. A well-defined set of classes will be such wherein a new instrument can easily be put in one asset class and not the other. The set of asset classes as a whole should cover the majority of all possible investable assets. That is every asset we should be able to put in some asset class or the other. If you are not then that probably is another asset class that needs to be defined. And finally, each asset class should contain a sufficiently large percentage of liquid assets. So each asset class will have thousands of securities. So this will normally not be a problem. But the idea simply is that if there is an asset class, I should be able to take exposure to that asset class. So all securities need not be liquid, but there should at least be four or five liquid securities in each asset class that I can easily invest. So please remember, when specifying your asset classes, that is specifying a group like debt, equity, venture capital, private equity, hedge fund, this is what you have to think about before you decide a new asset class is warranted or not. Now the curriculum mentioned and mentions and we will take an example of treasury inflation protected securities. So the question is, do tips warrant a separate asset class or should they be clubbed with some of the other known asset classes that we are aware of? Inflation protected securities have a coupon and a par value that varies with inflation. Do fixed income securities, corporate bonds or treasury bonds have such a description? Do their value change or does their value change with the inflation rate? In fact, the value comes down with inflation rate. Hence, it is sufficiently different. Of course, the confusion is, should tips be a separate asset class or should they be combined with debt? There is no reason for us to combine them with equity or venture capital. So when we are considering the differences from debt, yes, they are different from a descriptive perspective. Tips amongst themselves, some may give inflation plus LIBOR or a structure like that we can create, but the returns will be highly correlated amongst themselves. So if inflation goes up, normally the demand for all inflation protected securities goes up. They are not highly correlated with any other asset class. There is no other asset class that definitely always goes up or that owes value definitely always remains the same as inflation goes up. Tips have the advantage that value will not change even if inflation goes up because the discount rate may go up 
so will the coupon so the value will still remain near about the par value it's an inflation protected security individual assets cannot be classified into more than one class so if we have an inflation protected security we can clearly put it in the class of inflation protected securities hence it can be argued that inflation protected securities should be looked at like a separate asset class including which can provide diversification benefits to a portfolio and enhance risk adjusted return now a very important concept that assumes the mean variance optimization that assumes traditional finance is to determine whether or not to add a new investment to a portfolio so assuming we agree with the markowitz efficient frontier that we studied at level 1 and 2 and we agree on diversification benefits and that idiosyncratic risk can be completely diversified away a relatively simple rule can be derived to decide whether or not to place an asset into a portfolio or not so the rule is that if the sharp ratio of the new investment under consideration is greater than the current portfolio sharp ratio multiplied by the correlation of the new investment's return with the existing portfolio's returns then adding the new portfolio will improve the sharp ratio so to say if the sharp ratio of the new asset sharp ratio is defined as the return on the portfolio minus the risk free rate upon the standard deviation if the sharp ratio of the new investment is higher than the sharp ratio of the existing portfolio multiplied by the correlation of the new asset with the existing portfolio then adding the new investment will improve the portfolio sharp ratio assumption here is that sharp ratio is a measure of risk adjusted return that we want to maximize so si is the sharp ratio of the proposed investment sp is the current portfolio sharp ratio rho is the correlation of the proposed investment with the portfolio returns let's do an example and understand peter schumacher acts as a portfolio manager for a large mutual fund house the central bank is expected to announce its quarterly monetary policy next week it's a widespread belief that the bank is expected to lower down the interest rates to bolster growth the existing portfolio has no exposure in corporate bonds peter believes that the credit spread has reached its peak accordingly he plans to allocate a portion of the portfolio into corporate bonds the expected return standard deviation and sharp ratio of the existing diversified portfolio and of the corporate bonds is provided in the following table you are required to calculate the maximum correlation between the corporate bonds and his portfolio that would make the new investment still acceptable the risk free rate is given to be 5% so the correlation between the portfolio and the corporate bonds is not given and is asked and we are asked what is the value of that correlation such that or rather what is the maximum value of the correlation such that corporate bonds are still acceptable the decision rule is that if the sharp ratio of the new investment is greater than the sharp ratio of the portfolio multiplied by the correlation of the new investment with the portfolio then including i will increase sharp ratio so 0.36 that is the sharp ratio of corporate bonds should be greater than the sharp ratio of the portfolio that is 0.55 multiplied by the correlation between the two that means correlation must be less than 0.36 divided by 0.55 so the maximum correlation that corporate bonds can have with the existing portfolio so as to be still be useful has to be 
पॉइंट सिक्स फाइव इफ द कोरिलेशन इज एग्जैक्टली पॉइंट सिक्स फाइव फोर देन एडिंग द न्यू इन्वेस्टमेंट विल लीव द पोर्टफोलियो शॉप रेशो अनचेंज इफ द शॉप रेशो इज ग्रेटर देन एडिंग द न्यू इन्वेस्टमेंट विल इंक्रीज द शॉप रेशो इफ द शॉप रेशो इज लेसर देन एडिंग द न्यू इन्वेस्टमेंट विल डिक्रीज द पोर्टफोलियो शॉप रेशो हेनरी लिटमेन इज कंसिडरिंग टू इन्वेस्ट इन वन ऑफ थ्री रिस्की एसेट क्लास Data on the investments and his portfolio are provided in the table. Based on the data provided, determine which investment the manager should select. So pretty straightforward. The Sharpe ratio of the portfolio is given. We need to compare the portfolio Sharpe ratio multiplied by the correlation with the Sharpe ratio of the new asset. If this is greater, the asset class should be added. Else, it should not be. So again, 0.82 into 0.8 would be 0.64 something. So venture capital should not be taken. Similarly, 0.8 into 0.75 would be exactly 0.6. So whether we take them or we don't take them, the Sharpe ratio will not improve. Idea should be to improve the Sharpe ratio. Hence, if we take on REITs, then even though REITs have a low Sharpe ratio of only 0.2. But they have significantly low correlation with the existing portfolio. So 0.1 into 0.8 is just 0.08. The Sharpe ratio of REITs is higher than the product of the Sharpe ratio of the portfolio with the correlation. Hence, adding REITs will improve the Sharpe ratio because of the significant correlation or the diversification benefit that it will provide. The other two asset classes are probably already existing, or the Correlation with the current portfolio is quite high, so adding them will not give us much diversification benefit and will not improve the Sharpe ratio. So you must remember this formula. It's a pretty simple application. Otherwise, when investing in international assets, apart from just looking at the correlation and just looking at the analysis that we did in the previous slide and deciding whether to add that. international asset or not we should also be careful about certain other risks first is the currency risk however as far as equities are concerned we've seen that it doesn't make a very big difference so the standard deviation of the currency is generally speaking only about one half of the standard deviation of stock returns however in the case of bonds which are not as volatile as equity currency volatility can play a major role so currency volatility is seen to be twice as much as the bond volatility making it a much more important consideration for the bond markets so we should definitely be aware of the currency risk very importantly we should be aware and cognizant of the political risk which exists when a country has irresponsible fiscal or monetary policy and wherein the legal institutions the judicial system and the regulations do not provide reasonable support do not provide reasonable support and protection to investors and financial markets so because of these all your mathematics and your calculations can go for a toss if people decide not to honor their obligations or if the government decides to do something untowards we have generally seen that in international assets investments tend to be lesser because of home country bias so investors tend to overweight investments in their own country creating a suboptimal portfolio allocation because they don't have familiarity or they don't have confidence investing outside the home country so they may keep over investing in overvalued securities because they don't want to go outside you should be aware that investing abroad may have significantly higher transaction costs significantly lower liquidity governments may sometimes put withholding taxes which the foreign investors may not be able to offset by other global tax treaties that is the country that you are investing in may decide that all money repatriating or going out of the country will be taxed at 5% or will be taxed at 10% so any money leaving the country 
has to pay additional tax. Free float can be an issue as we understood that liquidity can be low since a lot of these markets were regulated, especially emerging markets, then the market cap may include a lot of shares that were that are held by the government and promoters or other big individuals who do not want to sell. Hence buying and selling into these stocks may be difficult. Inefficient market structure can result in high costs for security registration, settlement, custody, management and information. International assets do present significant opportunities. So because of the home country bias, foreign markets could be significantly undervalued and offer better expected return. While the investor's home market may have had good returns in the past, it may not be the case forever or it may not be a reliable indicator for future returns. A very common argument against investing in international assets and international equities is the phenomena of conditional correlations. So we have seen that correlations of international assets may be low, but they are low during the wrong time. That is when developed market equities go up, emerging market or international markets don't go up as much. Now this is when I want the correlation actually to be high because when the market is going up, I want the emerging market to also be going up so that my entire portfolio gains. What I want or when I want the low correlation is when developed market falls, the emerging market should not fall as much. That is here I want low correlation. In a fall, as an investor I want low correlation. In a rise in the domestic market, I actually would prefer a high correlation. What is seen is that correlations tend to be higher during falls and lesser during increases, which defeats the purpose of the low correlation. Correlation may be low, but it's low during good times and very high during bad times. Then am I achieving anything or is any diversification coming? This is the phenomenon of conditional correlations. Now, mathematicians and theorists argue that why this may seem to be happening and a lot of recent market movements may make you feel this way. But why this may seem to be happening is because the way the correlation is measured, that is the covariance upon the product of the standard deviations, this number tends to be higher mathematically when standard deviations are high or when volatility is high. So the argument against not being worried about conditional correlation is that this high correlation is actually not a very high movement. It's just a flaw in the way the correlation as a measure is calculated. However, that explains only a part of the phenomena of conditional correlations, that is correlations becoming high during downturns. To some extent, that risk remains. However, even adjusting for that risk or adjusting for conditional correlations, we've seen that even if the correlations rise during short term crisis, the long run benefits of diversification can remain from investing in international assets. Correlation amongst bond markets tend to be definitely lower than amongst equity markets. So including international bonds can definitely make sense. Even if you argue that equity market correlations are becoming much higher because the world is a much smaller place and a much more integrated place, bond market correlations are still seem to be quite low. So adding international bonds to a domestic only portfolio can be beneficial for diversification and reducing risk. We'll now move on to a very important part of the chapter that will exactly tell us about the different asset allocation approaches and techniques that one may follow. The first approach we've been studying since level one, it is called the mean variance optimization. 
And the mean variance optimization says that if a risk-free asset is not available, then we will select portfolios only along the efficient frontier. The efficient frontier is a set of portfolios that have the highest return for a given amount of risk. All these portfolios are also possible but are inefficient. Portfolios along this line are efficient. How do we derive the efficient frontier? Unfortunately, is a very long hard task. To derive the efficient frontier, we need to consider all possible investable assets first. So we are now answering the question how much debt and how much equity. We are studying different approaches that we can follow to answer that question. The first approach is the traditional mean variance optimization. The traditional mean variance optimization says that take into account all possible investable assets, weight them in different proportions, put a 100% weight to just one asset, put 111% weight to each asset, put 0.01% weight to some assets, 3% weight to other asset, construct practically infinite different portfolios, then apply the covariance matrix and compute the standard deviation of each of these portfolios. That was summation i equal to 1 to n, j equal to 1 to n, covariance of i n j. This will give you the variance of each of those portfolios. A weighted mean will give you the expected return. You will end up deriving infinite different portfolios, most of which will be inefficient. For a given standard deviation, then see what is the maximum return that you have achieved in any of those portfolios. Similarly, for a higher standard deviation, see which is the maximum return that you have been able to achieve. And that will give you your set of efficient portfolios or efficient asset allocations. Depending on the risk tolerance of the investor then, you will pick the most efficient portfolio or the most efficient asset allocation. The traditional method that we've always studied, if a risk-free asset is available, which is another problem because it is normally very difficult to find a risk-free asset, we'll come to that discussion next. But if a risk-free asset is available, then it will be the risk-free asset combined with the tangency portfolio that will give us the best combination of risk and return that we can choose. But again, deriving this tangency portfolio requires as much effort of first deriving the efficient frontier and then combining it with the risk-free rate to find the tangency portfolio. <coughs> the other issues argued here are that theoretically speaking, there is no risk-free asset. If you're talking about a one year time frame or an investment horizon of one year and we use the 10 year government bond as the risk free rate, then the value of the 10 year government bond will fluctuate with interest rates. So as interest rates change, there will be some standard deviation to this instrument as well. So risk free asset is defined as something which has a standard deviation of zero. So it may you may not be able to find theoretically a risk free asset. Even if you find a risk free asset, the whole mean variance optimization still needs to be done to find out the tangency portfolio. So please tell me, what are the two or three major issues with this first method of allocating assets or deciding the asset allocation? Remember the broader objective, we know the return requirement, we know the risk tolerance. We now, we now need to decide what assets to keep or what asset classes to keep and what proportion. First was the mean variance optimization. What are the issues with this approach?
please try to write down two or three issues that you think it is a possible essay type question now there are many issues first of all the mean variance analysis gives us no starting point that is if today i had to do the analysis i would have had to collect all possible assets in the world compute their expected returns and their variances second the mean variance analysis needs inputs as point estimates that is there is only one expected return and one standard deviation that i can input for each stock where we whereas we all know that returns there is an expected return but there can be significant deviation and returns follow a distribution however the mean variance analysis accepts its input as only a point estimate thirdly the analysis will have high sensitivity to these inputs so if i change the expected return for a stock from one number to another number later on i realize that expected return actually will be slightly different or risk will be slightly different and the whole asset allocation can completely change or can be very different the inputs themselves are estimates we are using historical expected returns normally as an input for future expected returns which may not always work and lastly the mean variance analysis may end up giving us highly concentrated portfolios so if by mistake or actually i enter some portfolio with a risk of 0 and an expected return of 80% automatically the entire process will shift or become highly concentrated on this portfolio because there's a risk of 0 so any correlation or any diversification you do will still have a highest weight or a 100% weight on this asset because it is giving a return of 80% that is much higher than all risky assets also that you have so if there are assets like these and the portfolio will become highly concentrated towards this asset so these are some of the problems that can come up when you do a mean variance analysis there is a traditional mean variance analysis consider the following two portfolios that lie on the efficient frontier portfolio m has the following exposures portfolio n has the following exposures 25% to cash 30% to bonds 18% to long term bonds 12% to corporate bonds and only 15% to equities expected return is 12% for portfolio m and 18% for portfolio n calculate the asset class weightings that is the combinations of portfolio m and n for the efficient portfolio with an expected return of 16% so if m and n lie on the efficient frontier and have an expected return of 12% and 18% then an expected return of 16% can be derived by weighting portfolios m and n so as to give us an expected return of 16% let's say w is the weight we place on portfolio m and 1 minus w is the weight we place on portfolio n then w into 12 plus 1 minus w into 18 should give us an expected return of 16% or in other words w will come out to be 0.33% and 1 minus w 
will come out to be 0.66 percent so if we put 33.33 percent of our portfolio in portfolio m then how much cash will we add 0.33 into 0.25 similarly intermediate bonds long term bonds corporate bonds and us equities will come from both portfolio m and portfolio n 33% is the weight of portfolio m so 0.33 into 0.25 is what cash will come in the portfolio from portfolio m and 0.666 has 30% cash so 0.666 into 0.3 is the amount of cash that will come in the portfolio because of portfolio n so 33% is the weight of m 67% is the weight of n hence cash and marketable securities in all will be a weight of 28% in our 16% return portfolio intermediate term bonds will be 20% long term bonds would be 24% similarly corporate bonds and us equities we will need this example and need this calculation in future questions when we study more advanced approaches and alterations of the mean variance approach so we studied the problems with the mean variance analysis once again very quickly no starting point inputs are all point estimates high sensitivity to inputs inputs themselves are estimates and may at times result in concentrated portfolios the second approach towards asset allocation that we'll study is called the resampled efficient frontier in the resampled efficient frontier the only change that we make is that instead of entering our expected return as one single point estimate we enter our expected return as a distribution so expected return or the return rather has an expected value but there is a distribution around the expected value so at a given point the return could be higher also with a low probability it could be lower also with a low probability but it's possible so in the resample deficient frontier we give a range of values for the expected return or the optimization process will pick values of the expected return from this distribution rather than a fixed expected return now what this would do is that rather than a single efficient frontier our efficient frontier will come out to be a blur so rather than a single curve or a single line that line will be something like the expected value of the efficient frontier but with some probability any given risk returns can be higher also if all stocks reacted positively or with some probability the returns with the same risk could be lower also so for any given risk the expected return will not just be one point it will be a range depending on this probability distribution that we are entering the advantage of this approach is that rather than giving point estimates we can give distributions the efficient frontier tends to be more stable because even if the return varies a little bit or even if the standard deviation varies a little bit yes it can go up a little or down a little but the average won't change as much as if i just inputted one expected return and then change that expected return because there is a whole range that i am anyways entering so even if i change that range slightly or even if i take even if i change the shape of the distribution slightly then it will have a relatively muted effect on the average 
even though these extremes could get affected. In the original mean variance analysis, there is no averaging. There is only one input and there is one emission frontier that comes. It also helps the portfolio manager in judging the need for rebalancing. So in the efficient frontier, as the frontier changed, for whatever reason, we would have to rebalance corresponding to the new frontier or corresponding to the new allocations. In a resampled efficient frontier, what I can say is that as long as the expected return is within this range, the portfolio is fine or we are near about there. If the expected return is deviating significantly from this range, then we need to rebalance and keep the assets such that they lie on the efficient frontier. So we don't have to continually rebalance as would be the case with a simple efficient frontier or mean variance optimization because as the inputs change or as new assets get added or as the standard deviations change, the efficient frontier would change and hence the asset allocation would change. So the resampled efficient frontier is more stable and we have seen that portfolios tend to be better diversified than a simple mean variance optimization. Disadvantage is that there is no theoretical reasoning that tells us resampling should provide superior performance or better performance. So the mean variance optimization theoretically is still a correct approach. There are some practical problems that we are trying to get around. But that doesn't mean that these portfolios will provide superior performance at all points in time. Yes, it will ease our job. We won't have to rebalance as much portfolio or the efficient frontier may be more stable. But there is nothing in theory that says that this is a better portfolio than what you did earlier. So we had many assets. We had an expected return. We had a standard deviation. We had covariances with all other assets for each of these. Instead of the expected return now, there will be a distribution of expected returns. So the expected return that will get picked in any one sample or any one iteration will come from this distribution. It may be the expected value, but with some probability it can be a higher or a lower value as well. So instead of entering one expected return, we enter a range of returns. Hence, the efficient frontier is not a straight line, it is rather a blur or it is a set of values. For each risk, there can be a set of possible returns. The big problem with the resampled efficient frontier is that it still hasn't given us any starting point. So in practicality, it is very difficult to apply either this approach or the earlier approach because I still have to collect all the possible investable assets. Yes, instead of just an expected return, I can give a, a range of expected returns or a distribution of expected returns. But the problem that I need to have all investable assets before I start doing my mean variance optimization still remains. The next approach is called the unconstrained black litumin model. We call it unconstrained because there are no constraints on short sales. So weight of an asset can even be negative. Just like it is in the mean variance optimization also, weight can be negative. So no constraints on short sales. The big advantage of the black Litterman model is that it draws weights from a global index. So this is the first model that now gives us a starting point. It says don't consider all investable assets. Take any diversified global index and many are available. The Morgan Stanley Emerging Market Index, S&P constructs its index. So the world index from any other source you can use. So it starts by drawing the weights of the assets in a global index. 
So whatever is the weight of a particular asset class, A, B, C, D, by default, that will be the weight in your portfolio as well. The manager can try to increase or decrease the weights on that or in that global portfolio depending on her views of expected asset class returns and the strengths of those views. So after giving a starting point that that is after giving us the set of investable assets set of investable assets will be those that are there in a global index. The black Letterman model also does a mean variance optimization. That is, these assets, let's assume there were five assets in the global index. These five assets are weighted with different combinations. And we try to compute the expected return and the standard deviation of my portfolio. So I can again draw an efficient frontier, but that efficient frontier will be from these assets that come from a global portfolio. Now if I want to increase the weight of a particular portfolio, of a particular asset in the portfolio, how I do that is by first of all increasing the expected return that goes as an input. So I will, let's say I am very positive on stock A. So I can either input a relatively higher expected return for stock A such that automatically in this optimization, the weight of stock A will be higher because only then the expected return on the portfolio will be the highest. And secondly, if I have a very strong view, that is I'm very confident of a 15% return from stock A, then I will enter a relatively lower standard deviation as well. Both these activities will tend to increase the weight of a particular stock in my portfolio. If I think the stock B has a weight in the global index, but I am not very comfortable keeping such a high weight, then I will enter a lower expected return and a higher standard deviation for stock B, such that in the mean variance optimization, automatically now the efficient frontier will consist of a higher weight of asset A and a lower weight of asset B. So strength of the view is expected is expressed through the assigned expected return and variance. Since the weights are originally based or basically come from a well diversified global portfolio, the resulting portfolio also tends to be well diversified. So remember, the black Letterman model also is a mean variance optimization. However, it gives us a starting point hence makes it a lot more practical than the traditional mean variance optimization or the resampled efficient frontier. In the constrained black Letterman model, there is constraints against short sales. So short selling is not allowed. Now, this is a reverse optimization process or it's slightly more complicated than the unconstrained black letterman approach wherein we simply change the expected returns and the variances or the standard deviations in order to increase the weight of a particular asset. In the constrained black letterman approach, the manager first inputs the worldwide asset class weights and the covariances amongst asset classes and the variances amongst the asset classes and solves for the implied expected returns. That is, the manager first tries to understand what is the consensus expectation from the asset classes. That is, if the covariances are known and the variances are known and the expected return from the global portfolio is known, then in a reverse optimization, we first try to get a sense of what is the market expecting from each of the assets that are there in the portfolio. The manager then takes a call whether the market is right or wrong. So if the manager feels 
that the market is over expecting or expecting a very high return from a particular asset then the manager will try to underweight that asset because he knows that such a high return will not come similarly if the manager feels that the market is expecting to a lower return from another asset and the actual return will be higher then the manager will deviate from the global portfolio the manager will overweight the asset so the first step is to derive the consensus expectations on the stocks and then express your view by overweighting or underweighting depending on whether you think you agree with the market's view or you don't agree with the market's view if you have no view or if you don't understand the asset well enough to take a call whether the market is right or wrong that may be possible because you do not have knowledge of every stock in the world then you just keep an equal weight that implies an average risk tolerance <clears throat> again a mean variance optimization is run so as to understand these consensus expectations and the implied returns and then once you increase your expected returns in a particular stock automatically the weight of that stock will increase so the unconstrained black letterman approach is simple in that we simply need to tweak the returns and standard deviations in the constrained black letterman approach we first understand consensus expectations and then we decide whether we want to overweight or underweight remember if we have no view that means an average risk tolerance we will keep an equal weight on the stock as the global portfolio let's do one example the global asset class weights are as shown so cash intermediate bonds long term bonds have an expected return as shown and the weights of each in a global portfolio are also shown assuming the portfolio manager can invest in only above eight classes determine the optimal portfolio allocation in the following situations using the black letterman approach when the portfolio has average risk tolerance if the manager feels corporate bonds and equity reits will both deliver 18% return so now he wants to exercise his view how will the allocation change so in the case of average risk tolerance the manager has no active view he will keep the same weights as they are in the global portfolio so as to formulate his asset allocation if the manager feels corporate bonds and equity reits will both deliver 18% return so corporate bonds which are expected to give 14% right now he feels will actually deliver 18% and equity reits will actually deliver 18% that means reits will deliver lesser than what the market is implying and bonds will deliver higher than what the market is implying then he would enter the new returns in a mean variance optimization that will likely result in corporate bonds getting a higher weight and equity reits getting a lower weight the rest of the approaches are relatively simple so a monte carlo simulation can model different strategic allocations we can input different distributions for different assets and try to see the portfolio values under different assumptions so different inflation measures yield spreads recession changes in each of these items in the next period as well as their compounding effect can be calculated with the help of a monte carlo simulation so again it very importantly overcomes the static nature of the mean variance analysis so if you are making a 10 year portfolio then in a mean variance analysis there is one input that we have to give for the 10 year expected return in a monte carlo simulation we can model it year by year or piece by piece can incorporate tax changes and other factors and 
manager then selects the most suitable strategic asset allocation that has a expected return profile most in accordance with the client's objectives. In the asset liability management type approach, we first construct our assets to mimic our liabilities. And then we manage the surplus to generate very high return. So surplus is invested in riskier securities so as to maximize the return. The investing of the surplus happens in a mean variance optimization type way, but a large part of our portfolio has already been fixed so as to meet our liabilities. So it's a much smaller part of the portfolio normally that will be expected to generate a very high return. The risk measure here or what I may want to minimize is the probability of being left with no surplus. The surplus becomes zero. That means my critical liabilities get impact. So it's also a relatively easier approach. Institutions with fixed contractual liabilities normally follow this type of approach. So instead of doing all the mean variance optimization and the uh, whole analysis, all of which anyways is based on a lot of estimates and uncertainties, we may simply choose to follow our experience. So experience says generally 60-40 is a good allocation. Put 60% in equities and 40% in diversified bonds. Another rule that has seemed to have worked historically is to follow the 100 minus age rule. So any investor's allocation to equities should simply be 100 minus his age. For an 80 year old investor, it should be 20% for a 20 year old investor it should be 80% allocated to equities definitely much simpler than all the other approaches that we have studied so the first approach we studied was the traditional mean variance optimization advantage is that the optimization programs that are used to generate the efficient frontier are normally readily available identifies portfolios with the highest expected return for a given level of risk. Any portfolio combination can be created by combining the tangency portfolio with the risk-free asset and this approach is widely understood and accepted. Disadvantages, the number and nature of estimates can be overwhelming. We discussed that. Expected returns are subject to estimation biases, especially since we are giving a point estimate. It's a static or a one period approach. So whether it's a one period horizon or a 10 period horizon, I have to give a 10 period expected return. Differences in expected returns across periods cannot be incorporated. It's possible that this approach yields under diversified portfolios and even the tangency portfolios at times can be a very concentrated portfolio as we understood with an example. The second approach we studied was the resampled efficient frontier. The efficient frontier here is more stable than the traditional mean variance because we give a range of inputs for the expected returns. Small changes to inputs produce only minor changes in the outputs. So that's one problem that it overcomes. Portfolios also have been seen to be better diversified than the traditional mean variance analysis. Problem however is that there is no theoretical support that the portfolio constructed through this method will be better or will give better performance than the traditional mean variance analysis. The black letterment approach, both the constrained as well as the unconstrained, help us in that we start with a global diversified portfolio. We can then adjust that portfolio based on the strength of our views. We've generally seen a stable efficient frontier and well diversified portfolios from this approach. The constrained black litterman allows portfolio constraints. So in a lot of funds, this actually is a constraint that you cannot short sell. There are a lot of long only funds in the world 
who can follow this optimization process. Again, well diversified portfolios and stable efficient frontier is the result, although it is a slightly more complicated process as we will see in the disadvantages. The problem with the unconstrained black litigant approach is that it allows no constraints and it again relies on historical returns, standard deviations and covariances and still uses the mean variance optimization to judge the weights or calculate the weights. So at least that amount of maths still has to go through even though the number of asset classes may be limited because they come from a diversified portfolio. Similarly with the black litigant approach the standard deviations and covariances are still needed even though we may be deriving the implied returns and it again uses the mean variance optimization and the mean variance optimization in turn relies on the capital market theory that we've been studying that for a given amount of risk the investor wants to maximize his return. Behavioral finance please recall argues it may not always be the case. So anyways all of them still are traditional finance methods or rely on traditional finance theory the variance as well as the black litigant approach. The Monte Carlo simulation overcomes the static nature of the typical mean variance analysis, incorporates the effects of various assumptions and capital market factors and can be used to generate a distribution of probabilities of meeting liabilities. So the Monte Carlo simulation if done properly can very categorically tell us what is the probability of not meeting the liability under different approaches or with different allo asset allocations and then the manager can select a given probability that he is willing to accept or a given risk that he is willing to accept. The problem always is that it will be complex to implement, can generate false confidence and the output is only as accurate as the inputs. That has always been the problem with the Monte Carlo simulation. Asset liability approach considers the allocation of assets with respect to the liabilities. Can generate an asset liability management frontier that shows the combination of risk and return and their probability of meeting the liabilities. So the risk in an ALM type model is not having a surplus or the surplus becoming negative the probability of which can be depicted and judged so that the investor can take a call. Suffers from estimation bias like most other methods and a static approach unless combined with the Monte Carlo or some other multi-period methodology. Experience based approach incorporates decades of asset allocation experience, easy to understand, inexpensive to implement. Definitely not based on sound investment strategy or any of the theories and the allocation rules may be too simple for some investors who have complicated factors and particular lifestyle circumstances that need to be adjusted for. So 100 minus age may not be able to work for every investor. 